Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo sadanto sucedoye alahadi san miao san putoshe. Namo sadanto sucedoye alahadi san miao san putoshe. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan shao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou chi, yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Shifu Shangren, Goei Shishong, Daja Omitofo. How is everybody doing? Today is Sunday, April 10th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. And uh, it is Saturday night, the 9th, back in California. Please calculate your date and time accordingly. Nice to see you all. Glad that you could make it to our Sutra lecture. Today we have a lot to cover. Uh, let's jump right in. First we'll invoke spiritual presence, ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near and bestow their light and well-being on everyone. to make a uh, shameless plug for another lecture. Uh, I'll, let's, let's do this first. Let's do our acknowledgement of country first and say that the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice their spiritual connections to land and all creation here in this location for thousands of years before the white race arrived. Today we acknowledge them as traditional custodians with gratitude that we share this land today with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and with the hope that we can move together to a place of justice and partnership. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. There we go. All right. Uh, now, the shameless plug that I had in mind was for another lecture that I'm going to be giving tomorrow. If you're in Australia, it'll be 12.30 in, uh, in the early afternoon in the Arvo. 
If you're in China, if you're in Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, it'll be two hours earlier, 10.30 a.m. Uh, if you're in California, it's Sunday night at 7.30. If you're in Europe, you can adjust. Uh, to, if you're in New York, bad luck. It's going to be, you know, late, 10.30. So, what's the point? It is the kickoff uh, Dharma lecture for the 10,000 Buddha's repentance ceremony, which is beginning uh, today, tomorrow, today. And uh, that 10,000 Buddha's repentance ceremony is the signature event for the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Although there are people who will say that it's actually the recitation of the Avatamsaka Sutra, which happens uh, also uh, at CDDB. But this is this uh, event, the 10,000 Buddhas repentance, uh, has been part of our calendar for uh, several decades and for as long as CTDB has been there. And it's, uh, it's quite an event. It's on an ordinary year that's not a COVID pandemic year. It's 21 days. And it ends on Buddha's birthday. It takes you right up to the, 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 the celebration in May of the, booth, the birth of the Buddha. And you people who take part in the 10,000 Buddha's repentance bow for uh, hours and hours every day for 21 days. And it's a remarkable experience if you've never done that. It's like doing slow yoga for eight hours a day. And you bow to the ground and chant the name of a Buddha. Uh, the, the Buddha's names are carried in a sutra called the Fo Shuo Fo Ming Jing. Sutra on the Buddha's teaching on Buddha's names. Sutra on the Buddha's explaining the names of Buddhas. And it contains not 10,000, but 11,000, 1,111 Buddhas and Pracheka Buddhas names. And you just go one by one by one through the, through the whole sutra. It takes a long time. Um, the amazing part is that you get to do it together in a community. And the, uh, the community is our people bowing right alongside you, to your left, to your right, back and front, and you do it to music. And each name gets bowed twice. One side bows and chants the name. The other side chants the name and bows. And then bow and chant the next name. And then do the next name. And the, uh, the energy that is created in the hall as people uh, sequentially bow through 10,000 Buddha's names is quite marvelous. It's really something. Because it's aerobic. It's, you know, it, you exercise. You bow down to the bowing bench with your side of the hall, and then you stand up, and the other side bows down. So everybody pretty soon starts to breathe together. And, of course, you're singing together, and there's a, a cantor, a wainal, the, it's the our, Chinese Sanskrit name for the, the ceremony master, the cantor who, who leads the chanting. And she has a, he or she has a counterpart on the other side of the hall. So you're, uh, you're chanting, Namo Ban Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo, down you go. Namo ban shi shi jia mo ni. And then, then you go through the next Buddha all the way down. And the first day, if you people, uh, you know, we go into it feeling all energized and all. But when you do that for hours every day, you come out of that with your legs like rubber, like wet noodles. You're, you, you walk like this because your legs don't really hold you. And it's... It's kind of like going zero to 60 uh, for an extended length of time. You know, your machine gets tested. Then the second day, you're every, uh, by, the, by the third or fourth hour of the bowing, you're th making promises to yourself. Uh, I can do it one more hour and then I'm out of here. I think if I get on my phone, I can probably get my brother to come pick me up. And, and it, somehow the energy carries you through and you don't make that call. And then on the third day, you're sure that it's only the Buddha's light holding you up. You feel like you have died and gone to the Pure Land. It's like, you, it's so hard, so painful. And people do 
flake off the edges. By the fourth day, something miraculous happens. And this is my experience, somebody who's done a lot of bowing, that by the fourth day, the blood cells have purged, the blood has purged the dead, dying, uh, you know, uh, muscles that, that flaked off into the, it, the, the dross has been purged, the, the excess calcium deposits have been removed out of your body, and you feel suddenly lighter and somehow able to fly. It's just amazing. On that fourth day, the bowing gets effortless. And from then on, it's just, you can do it. But those first three days, oh. And it's really important to have somebody telling you to hang in, don't quit, because the, the temptation, your, your cells, your blood cells, your muscle cells are saying, why are you doing this to me? Stop. Why are you trying to kill? I thought Buddhism was compassionate. You're killing me. What's wrong with you? It's hard. And, and then uh, there's that change. And it has a lot to do with the community energy as well. Just having, doing it together with 300 people in one room is uplifting. It's, it's remarkable. Plus, plus, I didn't mention one aspect, which is there is a transference that happens, a transference of merit, dedication of merit that's part of the sutra, and it's celebrated every day after the, the end of the bowing. There's, there's a transference right before lunch, before the, the uh, long life plaques. You go to the Medicine Buddha Hall, and, and you do a transference, and you go have lunch. Then there's another transference that you do at the end of the bowing day, which is about 4 o'clock. But there's, there is a regular part of, of the ceremony that is the, the sutra's transference and something about that is the most uplifting. It's, it's based on bodhisattvas sacrificing their comfort and well-being on behalf of others. That's the text. And as you recite it, you read along and it's, so it's like uh, you say it's like forest of merit and virtue bodhisattva who in the past gave up his hands to countless times to benefit living beings who needed hands uh, i too will be like him oh it's like uh, vajra treasury bodhisattva who in the past gave up his eyes countless times for the sake of others who needed them you know i too will be like him and it's like that and it's just so spiritually energizing and i remember that that dedication part of the ceremony is just Amazing, just amazing. So anyway, that's happening. And you can join in online. This year is different. Like last year was different. Um, thanks to the, uh, the power of the internet, um, we are able to take a microphone into the Buddha Hall where this is being so <coughs> uh, celebrated at CTDB and gave the microphone to the Ueno, the, I believe it's the nuns who are leading it this year, and she will chant for you, and you can dial in on Zoom, or I believe it's Zoom or, or YouTube, I don't know, and uh, join in. And of course, they can't do as many hours in a day online, so it's gonna take longer. It's gonna take, I think they say four or five or six weeks even this year, not three. So I'm gonna ask the monks at BBM or uh, let's see, I see that Jin Chuanshir is on now. If you wouldn't mind at the end of today's lecture to give us the details of how we can log on. I think uh, Jin Yongshir sent the emails out with the link. So when this lecture is over today, if you wouldn't mind including that information in your report from BBM. Okay, good, all right. So, you all have to hang in through the lecture to get the information. You wanna bow this year, you gotta to listen to my lecture. Okay, so that's coming up. Got a lot to get to today. Um, we have, notice my apples, how do you like my apples there? Um, we have a new chapter of the sutra, and it's called, it is called the, 
going to make it nice and big so everybody can see it. Here we are. It's called the Sheng Ye Mo Tian Gong Pin Di Shi Jiu, ascending to a palace in the Suyama heaven. It is the 37th scroll of the second Avatamsaka Sutra. It's chapter 19. And we've got, we're working on a provisional translation. We will have a beautiful, uh, well laid out, multilingual text to work from in a bit. It's in progress right now. It's because I'm slow making up my mind about uh, the, which chapter is, is the reason why we don't have our text yet. Uh, but it's coming up, coming up. So, chapter 19. Let me tell you a little bit about where we are. The Avatamsaka Sutra is interesting among other Buddhist sutras in that it was not originally spoken in one place. They talk about it as qi chu jiu hui, hua yin jing. It was explained in seven places, nine, a total of nine times. So two of the places were visited twice by the Buddha. So um, there's, to go back into, give you the real background, um, the tradition says that the Avatamsaka, let's see, I can give this full screen to, oop, not that, close that. I want to do a full screen for everybody here. Let's see, view, edit window, Hi tab, or how do we do full, full screen? Right there. Okay, there we go. So uh, the tradition says that when the Buddha woke up under the Bodhi tree, the first thing he explained was the Avatamsaka Sutra. That's, that's how the tradition says. And he spoke it for bodhisattvas and for devas who had the background of samadhi to be able to understand it. Otherwise, it's, they talk about it as uh, milk right from the cow. And if you know anything, ever lived in a farm, milk right from the cow is hard to digest. It's got all the butter fat in it. It's got bits of straw and, you know, manure. And it depends on how clean the farmer's hands was as he, as he hooked the cow up to the machine or milked it himself. So it takes a strong stomach to digest milk right from the cow. It takes a bit of wisdom to understand the Avatamsaka Sutra right off the bat. So that's uh, one way they talk about this sutra. The Buddha noticed that people, beginners, weren't there, and he continued on to explain the Agama Sutras, which talk a lot about cause and effect, talks a lot about um, goodness, talks about rewards and karma that brings you misery, talks about how to cultivate the basics. So that's the Buddha shift downshifted out of overdrive fourth gear third gear second gear then into first gear moving slowly so that people could get it then the other periods were uh, explained just the same way that you start with whole milk and you pasteurize it and homogenize it and make it non-fat and make it skim and make it two percent and so people can digest Milk, if you're a, now I'm a vegan, so that's this, this, the, the milk analogy doesn't work for vegans anyway. So there's no sixth, the, the sixth category of the, uh, of the milk analogies would be no milk. So that's the, the, uns, that's the, uh, the unspoken dharma, right? The mind transmission dharma. Okay, so from the Bodhi tree, they say, the Buddha traveled and in the fourth assembly, he went to the Suyama Heaven Palace. That's where we are in this lecture. The uh, 10 stages that we just finished was at a different place. What's the Suyama Heaven? So here's, uh, I, I spoke to my colleague, Dharma Master Jin Yong, uh, and said I was gonna use his description of the Buddha's heavens today, and I decided not to do that. I'll do it next week. He came up with a lovely slideshow that describes how you make one world, 
you know, the four continents, the oceans of fragrant water, the surrounding ring mountains, a sun and a moon, and in the middle, Mount Sumeru, the polar mountain. And he's got a beautiful slide deck that describes that and how you go from there to time and space from the Buddhist point of view. And I, uh, I will get that together for next week. The, what is the Suyama heaven? Why haven't we heard of that heaven before? Well, one description of this, where the Buddha went, says that he traveled through the heavens to deliver uh, many of his Avatamsaka lectures. Seven places, nine lectures. This is the fourth place. And it's a heaven, it's a level of heaven that is higher than what is known as the Triastrimsha heaven, the heaven of the 33 gods, known in Chinese as the Dao Li Tian, San Shu San Tian. It's higher than that one. Now, why mention the 33, the heaven of the 33 gods? Because that's where Lord God of the Abrahamic traditions is said to reside. Now, if, you, if your story about how the world is made is based on the Abrahamic traditions, and most of the world is, this is gonna sound curious to you. It's like new information or just wrong, maybe. We're not gonna argue about that today. Um, so here's the, here's the way it's laid out. They say, this is the way from the Buddha's vision, the Buddha opened his wisdom eyes and says, here's how the world is made. He says, we humans are in a continent currently called Southern Jambudvipa, the land of the Jambu tree. And there are three others. There's North, South, East, West, different continents. So we're in the Southern continent and we are below Mount Sumeru. Mount Sumeru, Shumishan, is in, I can't see it with my eyes. The Buddha uses his wisdom and says, yes, it's really there. And if you, if you look up, halfway up Mount Sumeru is the first of the heavens. That is called the heaven of the four kings. Si Tian Wang Tian. And these four kings there are called Zhuan Lun Sheng Wang. They're called Chakravartins, wheel turners. They can turn the wheel. And they, they're in charge of different spiritual communities, different spiritual beings. They subdue demons and ghosts and baddies, and that's their job as heaven, kings of heaven. They are gold, silver, uh, copper, and bronze, or iron. Yeah, iron, bronze, silver, and gold. The four kings are known by the metal that they represent. And they, we here at the city, at the Gold Coast Armor Realm, have a brand new front gate, and our front gate shows the four kings of heaven. You know, they're, get my head, poses like that. One of them is holding a pipa, holding a, a musical instrument. One of them is holding a vajra pestle. They're pretty awesome looking. And th that heaven is said to be right above us. So, the, you know, immediately you want to do this. You know, you look up in the sky and you think, where is that heaven? That heaven is not visible to ordinary vision like, like we have. Um, but the, not only Buddhist descriptions of the heavens say it's really there, but the descriptions in mythology from the Hellenistic world, Greek mythology says, yep, really there, really there. This is Mount Olympus, and gods live there, different categories of gods. Okay, continue up to the top of Mount Sumeru, and you get to the second level of heavens. That second level of heavens is said to be called the Triastrimsha. That's Sanskrit for 33 gods. And there are various stories of how it happened, but there are that's a heaven that is on top of Mount Sumeru. And I'm always doing this because Mount Sumeru has got a, a funny shape. It's shaped like that. So the second level of heaven is located on the top of Mount Sumeru. And the leader there, the, the chief among gods, is known as 
Chakra, Devanam, Indra, Lord Chakra, also known as Indra. We hear about Indra's net, that's where Indra's net is located. And the sutras, particularly the Avatamska, carries a lot of information about this, this heaven and all of the details there. Uh, for example, Chakra has a palace, and that palace is known as the Shan Jian, Gong Dian, Shan Jian Dian, the palace of wholesome views, good viewpoints. Or it could even be nice landscape, Shan Jian. Feng Jing Hao Mei, it's a beautiful landscape. So one of the adornments of Lord Chakra's heaven is this net of perfect pearls that in every place where the net crosses in each interstices, there's a perfect pearl held in the net. And the pearls have this quality that each pearl reflects the totality of all the other pearls. You look into it and you can see all the other pearls and all the pearls return to a single pearl. So there's this incredible one to the many and then back to the one, this kind of breathing and the macro and the micro exchange places at Indra's net. It's quite spectacular adornment, decoration. So Chakra, Devanam Indra, Lord, Lord Indra, Lord Chakra, he's got those, both those names, is known to the Hindu pantheon. Chakra shows up, he's not just a Buddhist, divinity. Furthermore, there are stories that say, and I'm not going to own it, I'm not going to testify to it, there are stories that say this is Lord God, the supreme being. All believers in the Abrahamic traditions go, I'm going to wash my ears out, I didn't hear that. So that's what they say. Um, in the sutras, Lord Chakra is Tajao Shirti Huanyin. The Taoists know him as Yu Huang Da Di. The Taoists know this God. He is the Jade Emperor. So, hmm, interesting. Now, let's look to the Greeks. Do the Greeks talk about gods on this mountain? Oh, do they ever? Yes, indeed. Could this be Zeus? Hmm. If you write your master's thesis on this topic, give me a credit, all right? This is, could it be Jupiter? Could it, yeah, huh. Chief among gods, interesting. Now, if you go to the Norse mythology, the Norse Loki, or uh, who's the, the chief among gods in the, Odin, Odin, Odin. So is Odin, is that Zeus, is that Chakra, is that Lord God? That's, that's your PhD thesis. You have to expand your research. So anyway, interesting that these, ancient, ancient stories of human from the earliest days of human history all talk about a mountain where the gods live. Hmm. Interesting. So the Buddha says, yes, indeed. Every world is built the same way with a mountain in the center and sun and a moon, four continents, and the stories that arise. So, okay. That's the second level. Now, what happens when you continue up into the pantheon of heavens? There are six. There are six levels of heaven as described by the Buddha. And number three is called the Ye Mo Tian, sometimes called Shu Ye Mo Tian, the Suyama heaven. And it's good birth, yemo tian jiao sheng, shan yemo, shan sheng, shan, what is, I just lost this suyama. Somebody translate suyama for me. It's, it means, that in the Chinese they just do the sound, yemo, shu yemo. It's a heaven that is above the sun and the moon, therefore beyond the level of light that we know, and the devas there communicate by lights from their bodies. This is the third level of heavens in what is called the Yu Jie, the desire realm, the realm of desire, which is where we abide. We're on the earthly level. We're in the ter terrestrial level. These are already gods. They're in heaven. Notice plural, not one, but many. 
So, okay, the gods shed light from their bodies. The other descriptions say that the gods, uh, if you're in a romantic relationship, husband and wife among the devas, which can happen, you communicate, you have your relations not physically, but through, through lights. That the attraction and the exchanges of affection and all are done through lights. How interesting. Uh, subtle. It's more subtle than kind of coarse, you know, terrestrial ways. Even in the heaven of the 33, you still physically get together. So interesting how these, as the heavens go up, they refine. They become more subtle, more sublime. Okay. There is a palace in the, that belongs to the god that in charge of the Suyama heaven. That's where the Buddha is going to give this talk. Got it? That was my introduction to the Suyama heaven. Uh, I, I wish I could describe it from my own experience. I can't. I don't recall the last time I was at the Suyama heaven. Maybe I've been there before and fallen back, and who knows? So, um, there are, interestingly enough, three more heavens above the Suyama heaven before you get out of the desire realm. Where does Mara, the chief demon, the king of the demons, where does he live? He lives above number six. He's on top of the desire realm. And to get to the form realm, which is the next level of gods, you have to go beyond Mara. You have to get past his testing and the way you do it is you transform selfish desire. The me and the mine and I want has to be gone from your, from your conscious stream, stream of consciousness. And if you can, through a process of meditation through the dhyanas, chan ding, right, dhyana, known in Pali as jhana, if you in your cultivation can get to that place of your desires get progressively thinner and thinner and lighter and lighter until external things no longer excite you, your eyes don't linger on specific forms, your ears don't hate certain sounds, your love and hate doesn't, don't move you anymore because you've been meditating to a place where you see through the illusion of form, you analyze all things back to their constituent elements of earth, air, fire, and water, you can reach that state known as the first dhyana, or the second, or the third, chu chan ar chan san chan si chan, the four stages. And guess what? Your essential spirit goes beyond Mara. You're in the form realm. You're in the Brahma realm, the Brahma heavens another level. There are 28 levels of heavens there. You go even more subtle, you leave the form realm to the formless realm. There are four levels there. So this teaching, this is all what? Buddhist cosmology. This teaching on the realms of heavens is profound. This is very detailed, very uh, mm, how do you say uh, the, there's a Chinese way of describing. This is uh, well-researched, very orderly, very particular. It's not, well, pie in the sky when I die by and by. I'm going to gonna go up and be with my Lord. That's good. That's fine. The Buddhist version of that is, uh, how much samadhi do you have? That determines which heaven you know about, that you can see and interact with. You can become a god in through your meditation, your fa shen hui ming, your dharma body and your wisdom life entitles you to interact in a stage with the devas, okay? So it's not exclusive. It's not the only owned by a priest caste or the family who passes on the pope, you know, through the through the Italian families who uh, became, wanted to be Holy Roman Empire and have all the state's power and the church's power in one person. Not that, it's like you, how's your meditation? How's your desire? 
Can you transform your desire? You can become God-like as soon as you meditate, right? You don't have to wait. So it's a very different way of approaching what is holy, what is sacred, what is pure, what is worth doing as a human being. It's different. It's a different story. And it's very egalitarian. It opens up to anyone who wants to put in the work. And that appeals to me. That, that's really profoundly attractive to my mind uh, as, as a body of religious teaching. So, okay, Suyama heaven. The Buddha goes to the Suyama heaven because why? He's got some Avatamsaka Dharma to deliver. Time to go to the fourth Di Si Hui, the fourth assembly of the Avatamsaka Sutras, many teachings. And in this, in the Suyama heaven, he delivers, there are four chapters. There's the uh, Sheng Ye Mo Tian Gong Pin. There's the Ye Mo Tian Gong Ji Zhang Pin. The first is ascending to the Suyama heaven. The second is verses of praise in the Suyama heaven. That's what we're going to cover next, these two. We're going to do the welcome. The first, that first chapter, chapter 19, is just a welcome. He welcomes the Buddha. The Suyama heaven king comes out and says, welcome. You're not the first one to be here. And I'll tell you who's been here before. That's what that chapter is about. Uh, the second one, chapter 20, is the praises. And the praises are super. They're just so good. It's the bodhisattvas who have come to hear the Buddha speak the Dharma here in the heaven of the Suyama palace, the Suyama heaven palace, all in turn sing praises. And you know, there's this verse that is the signature verse of the Avatamsaka. This is one verse that comes out of the entire sutra that people know. There, there are others, but this is, if they know anything about the Avatamsaka, it's this signature verse. If someone wishes to know the Buddhas of the three periods of time, contemplate contemplate the nature of the Dharma realm, how everything is made from mind alone. Everything is made from mind alone. That verse is the hallmark verse of the entire sutra. It occurs in this chapter, here in the Suyama heaven. So that's why I picked this one. Okay, how are we doing? Are we, uh, we still on track, everybody following? This is the background for what we're about to, to investigate. I predict it will take us into September, I think. Maybe it'll take us, I suspect, about six months to get through. That's just rough. Maybe I'll give you a progress report as we get closer. But um, this first chapter 19, the ascent to the palace is, is really short. It's one of the briefest of all. It's over before you know it. Um, we're going to do a piece of it today. But then, uh, given all of the things going on, um, we'll move through that quickly and move on to chapter 20, which is those praises. Okay? I suspect it'll be autumn before we're... It'll be spring here in Australia and autumn in... Uh, in North America. Alrighty? Okay. Here we go. Give me a second here. Dee dum dee dum. Chi chu jiao hui. Okay. Alright. Alright. Oh, okay. Here, I want to share something with you first. This is. Uh, there we go, there we go. There are the apples. Um, in case, in case anybody has a spare six million dollars, I know where we can use it. I wanna, you got 5.8 million. We, it may be too late. I don't know if it's been sold already but there is a Guanyin Bodhisattva image for auction. 
It's a Song Dynasty Guanyin Bodhisattva, and it's very special. Anybody care to bid? This is a Song Dynasty Guanyin Pusa, available at Sotheby's in London. They predict it will go for, it, it may have already been up, I couldn't get the date correct, but it, it up, it's up for 45,728,000 Hong Kong dollars. 45,728,000 Hong Kong dollars. Richard Doshao, 45,728,000 Hong Kong Gangbi. Eight. Oh, my, my converter said 5.8 million U.S. dollars. Oh, for Australia. Australia. That's quick. Okay, so Australian dollars, 7.8 7 million, million. American dollars, 5.8 million. Uh, you know, what, do you, what are we going to do with your money? We Just get real here. This is, if you can own a Song Dynasty Guanyin that looks like this, I can't think of any better investment. I mean, look, your, your worries are over if you, <laughs> you can bow to this image every day. Oh my goodness, this is just superb. Guan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, there she is. That's in what's called uh, Royal Ease is the name of this posture that this image is in. Yeah, that just makes me feel safe and peaceful, right? There we go. Okay, so someone is uh, asking. There we are. There it is. Someone is saying, uh, wouldn't it be a good use of the six million instead to do donate to the Ukrainian people or buy vaccines or build DRBU? Sure. Now, that is, that's a good question. And this, okay. This is an important question. So, part, you know, I'm partly tongue in cheek, partly, let's see. Did I, uh, yeah, here. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Here we are. This is indeed the very website. Uh, how do I na navigate? I want to see here. There we go. This is an extremely magnificent and extremely rare large wood sculpture of Avalokiteshvara Sung Dynasty. Mu Diao Jia Cai. Guan Xin Pu Sa Zuo. Guan Xin There's the, uh, the lot for it, estimated between 30,000 and 50,000. I think it went for 45. So, Sotheby's. Okay, there you go, you saw it. Now, the question is would it be better to use 5.8 million US dollars to aid the Ukrainian people? Uh, would it be better to use that money to donate to hungry folks? Uh, indeed, indeed. The question is, and why that's a good question, is people who are in immediate physical need, if you're hungry, if you're cold, if you're sick, if you are sick and have no medicine, uh, if you're aged and have no one to care for you, you are experiencing immediate suffering and grief. If your house has been leveled by a rocket and you have no home to return to, if your city has indeed, like Mariupol in the southeastern Ukraine has been destroyed, so 90% of the buildings are no longer livable. That is immediate suffering. 
And there is anyone whose heart feels with humans' feelings wants to relieve that suffering. You want it, you want to do it. However, people are more than our bodies. We are also our, the in, inside part, many names, soul, spirit, nature. Everyone walking and breathing has that soul, that nature, that spirit inside them. Not just people, but your kitties, your puppies, your birds, your fish, your snakes in a terrarium, whatever animals around you, your stock animals out in the barn, in the barnyard, on the farm. Each has that nature. Where does that nature go for its spiritual food? Our spirits can starve as well as our bodies. And when you see something like this, when you see this, you think, hmm, I am fed by that. That is nourishing. Furthermore, the story that this Guan Yin Bodhisattva represents, which is Shun Sheng Jiu Ku. Guan Yin Bodhisattva responds to our cries and gives us a hand. Wu Yuan Da Si Tong Ti Da Bei, compassion, kindness for, even for those who, with whom she is not related. Same body, great compassion. When I hear the story that this image represents, I feel my fears go away. It's like my strength returns. I can do things, I can face things that otherwise I can't do, that I can't face because they're just too awful. So my question is to the person who just asked Jerry and said, you know, what do I do? What, what if, if I had six million dollars? Do you know what one fighter jet costs? Ben, what does a fighter jet cost? 100 million, I was gonna guess, 100 million dollars. One airplane that can be shot out of the sky by one anti-aircraft missile and that 100 million dollars is just scrap metal, right? So munitions, things that are designed to kill Humans, that's their only purpose, is to destroy human life. Those things like that are being, you know, used in this, our current war and wasted and, you know, armaments, the money for arms is just obscenely used to destroy life. This six million dollars can be used to, <laughs> to feed the hungry, sad, yearning, lost souls by the millions. And wouldn't it be nice to have this saved from a collector? <laughs> Where it's likely to go? It's likely to go into a collection somewhere, you know, uh, which is fine as long as it's protected. But an image like this has the power when you make offerings to it and bow to it and turn to it in your time of need and talk to it. People talk to their Guanyin images. I talk to my Guanyin image. And oh, the goodness that can come for that for a mere $5.8 million. Get out your checkbooks, man. Ah, uh, anyway, so there you go. And I'm, you know, I'm partly partly in jest. I did that whole thing without showing it to the audience. Here we go. There we go. There we are. That is wonderful, right? So what do you say to that? Not sharing. Screen is not sharing. There it is. There we are. I got to learn that habit to make sure I'm sharing the screen. That image 
can stop a war, right? There's just something that touches the heart when you see that. So, uh, as I tell you, as I saw that, uh, this come up, yeah, one of the finest I've ever seen, correct. When I saw this image, um, I thought, boy, I should probably devote the rest of my life learning how to make an image like this. Instead of worrying about a Song Dynasty image that's going for $5.8 million, break out your chisel. We're surrounded by trees here. Get, find the right tree. Get the, prepare the wood correctly. Who, who has used Gigi wood here in Australia or mahogany to carve Buddha images? Probably not that many people. Why not start it? Sam, get to work, man. Richard, Ben, sharpen your chisels, man. Let's go. <laughs> make another one. Make a dozen of them. Make a hundred of them. Make a thousand of them. I mean, this is a lovely image, but why worry about a Sung Dynasty image when we are surrounded by trees? Look at the color. This was multicolored before. And it's so finely embroidered, you know. Who knows how many images the Buddha carver had to make before they could get this one guanyin that looks so good. This is not his first attempt, whoever he, he or she was. Anyway, uh, I think money spent on Buddha images is national defense. That is money well spent, not bombs. Buddha images, not bombs. Bodhisattva images, not bombs. All right, there we go. So thank you, Sotheby's, for putting it out for sale. I sure hope the right person brought it home. I do indeed. All right, let's dig in. I've introduced you to the story behind where this part of the sutra was explained. And now let's touch on the first words of chapter on the ascent to a heaven in the Suyama, to a palace in the Suyama heaven. Here we go. Ready? Uh, then the Tathagata's awe-inspiring spiritual power allowed everybody see I need I'm not doing it again there we go oh I was I was let me get it straight here we go sharing I need a robot to remind me every time here we go then the Tathagata's awe-inspiring spiritual power allowed everybody gathered in southern Jambudvipas in the continents of worlds of every direction as well as beings on the summit of Mount Sumeru, the polar mountain, to witness the Tathagata sitting at rest amid all the gatherings. Those bodhisattvas each received the Buddha's spiritual strength and with that inspiration spoke Dharma. Without exception, each of them felt that the Buddha sat directly in front of them. How about that? Okay, so we're continuing on from the previous chapter, which happened, which took place not in the Suyama heaven. Uh, and it picks up, the action picks up where it left off. So the Buddha has released light. And the light, when it touches the beings who were in this, at the, there at the time, things happen. They get to see things they couldn't see before. And it says, everybody specifies that, first of all, we have worlds of 10 directions. So you think of the Buddha, not just in one place, but 
there's this, uh, what would it be, a kind of a parallel universe, that's the language we use. It's a, a phenomenon that things here get reflected to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the intermediate directions, northeast, southeast, north, northwest, southwest, and then below and above. Ten directions. And further, when you're, you're thinking of the sphere that we've now created in every direction, it comes back to the mind. Again, there's this phenomenon of outside and inside interpenetrating without obstruction. Chong chong wu jin, hu xiang wu ai. That's, that's the way the, la the language goes. So from the Buddha's mind, which has no obstructions, out to the world of ten directions, unobstructed, there's light that shows beings in southern Jambudvipa. That's where we are. As well as Mount Sumeru, the one I just described, with beings above it sitting on the summit, so that's the heaven right below where the Buddha has just been, to now see Buddhas sitting in each of these places, okay? So we have to hold some things in mind to get the way this is working. The Buddha shows everybody that there are Buddhas sitting in all directions. So we see that, all right? Now, Bodhisattvas, now it changes, Bodhisattvas in each of those places receive that light from the Buddha. And why? They're about to speak. They're about to speak Dharma. And the Buddha has just blessed them with energy, with clarity, with vision, we say he put the whammy on them. The Buddha somehow zapped all these bodhisattvas because why? They're about to speak. And once they get that inspiration from the Buddha, it's time for them to speak. And they speak with more clarity and insight. And they remember the best stories. The Dharma they speak is fun to listen to. It's enjoyable. It's informative. It's unforgettable. And they're ready. They're prepped to speak the Dharma. Now, what I like in this passage is it specifies that something, something funny happens here, which says, every one of these ten bodhisattvas, and we get to meet them in the next chapter, every one of these ten bodhisattvas has a feeling that the Buddha is looking directly at them. Isn't that funny? How is that possible? That's a phenomena, isn't it? Yep. How many, how many people who attended one of Master Hua's sutra lectures said the same thing? Anybody from that generation who is hearing this lecture is nodding their heads right now because that was what happened. It was unusual to say the least. We would be sitting in uh, Jerry just commented our engineer volunteer uh, Sizop says that uh, he sitting when you attend a live lecture at Berkeley Monastery they have the same feeling. How about that? So what is it? It's a phenomenon. It must be the Avatamsaka Dharma, something about the wind of this sutra, to go Hua Yin Jing the Tao Feng, something like that. The wind of the way of the Avatamsaka gives this strange experience that somehow the sutra is not only is the speaker in front of you, but the Dharma is coming to your heart. That's an unusual reality that people report. Now, it's comfortable only if <laughs> you, you come with a clean slate, <laughs> only if your heart is pure. Uh, if you're hiding something, it's uncomfortable to have this feeling that the Buddha is on your case. 
if you have certain secrets in your heart that you don't want revealed at the moment, uh, it's a very uh, unsettling experience. But following that is a goodness and a kindness that knows that there's no harm here. It's just, it's unnerving to have your secrets revealed, to have your, your heart be transparent. And that was the feeling at Gold Mountain Monastery, for sure. And people would talk about it. They would say, why, uh, how, why do I have the feeling that Sherpa's reading my mind? Why does he know what I'm thinking? And now, it, unfortunately, that was my camp. I n was never in the camp that was totally open. And imagine if your heart was clean. It was a magnificent experience of you and, and Sherpa's mind being one. But I recall, I need to... So what are we talking about? We're talking about none, not, self, say, always facing to Buddha. Right? That's the Chinese here. None, not, say of themselves, always facing to Buddha. Without exception, each of them felt that the Buddha sat directly in front of them. That's the better translation of that. Okay, so I remember uh, I was a graduate student and my former college roommate, now Bhikshu Hangyo, had recruited me to come and help translate. Master Hua was explaining the sutras, particularly on Saturdays. I was a full-time master's candidate. I had to, to spend time uh, doing my, my classes and research and all. But on Saturday, it was my day to go across the Bay Bridge in my 1965 Volvo sedan and park in front of Gold Mountain Monastery and run from the street into the door because that was a tough, tough neighborhood in the Mission District. And uh, so I would do that, lock the car, jump out, run across, go in the door, bang, 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 and have lunch, sometimes bow the Medicine Buddha repentance in English that we had going. And then after lunch, sit in and translate for Master Hua's Saturday afternoon lecture. That was my introduction to Gold Mountain and to Master Hua. I did this for about a year. And it was sublime, except on those occasions when Friday night had been, you know, a Berkeley co-op collective commune Friday night, which involved all sorts of uh, mood-enhancing substances, to say the least often in a hot tub. Next door was a hot tub and uh, a guy who was infamous for dealing in all kinds of substances whose license plate on his Rolls Royce was into it, meaning he was into it. And he, was, he had the bank account of a drug dealer, so he drove a Rolls Royce. This guy, uh, Morty, Mort, Mort, Murray, what was his name, Morton, yeah. Marvin, he was Marvin, Marvin. And so I would, I tried my best and gradually as I cleaned the ignorance off my Buddha nature, I got less and less involved. But at the start, I was involved in that lifestyle, living in the Berkeley Hills. And I would show up at Gold Mountain Monastery the next day, still with the fumes of whatever had, you know, had happened. And Master Hua would be sitting here beside me on the seat and I'm down below translating and thinking I hope he doesn't you know <laughs> Sherfa would look over and kind of smile you know how do you feel he would say <laughs> need some young uh, hi ha you know <laughs> very gently very kindly I mean in if if Sherfa was into rejecting his disciples or judging them then he would say, you know, you're, get your butt out of this temple. You're polluted. You're totally unfit to be sitting here. He didn't. He understood that people wake up at different speeds, different paces. And I was into habits along. I was not the only one, certainly, my generation. Friday night, you party. And parties involve and 
drinking alcohol and consuming other things. So there I was volunteering in my turn. I had signed up to translate. Unfortunately, the night before I had, had been partying. And so I, my bloodstream still carried the traces of those substances I'd imbibed and Buddhism doesn't use intoxicants. Yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, uh, 22 year old college students did. And so there I was. And Shurfu would look over, look down, and smile, that broad smile. And I never felt rejected. I never felt judged. I felt embarrassed. I felt ashamed because Shurfu clearly knew what had happened. He could smell it, I'm sure, you know, my clothes. But it would, he, the feeling was, it's all right, try your best. You want to volunteer? If you can help the people in the audience understand what I'm going to say because you can understand some Chinese, do that. That's your role now. And the road ahead is open to you. There's always room to change. You can change. Wake up and you don't need to put substances in your bloodstream to get high and have fun. How much fun are you having sitting there now, the day after? Not much, right? So change. You can change. You can do it. Furthermore, that kindness and that acceptance and that lack of judgment and the, the, the gentleness of his understanding of me as somebody who could cultivate gathered me in and it didn't push me away. So as a result, I chose to be free of intoxicants because it felt better and it was, I could see further and it was really mine. And I could, for the first time, inside my own nature, sense a change. And the word purity purifying, gradual purifying, feels good. It feels good to clean up and not be confused and always kind of that sea and slightly not there and slightly out of, you know, very much not in charge of my life. Getting in charge of your own mind step by step, letting go of things that you know you don't need anymore, that feels so good. Bit by bit, you're life becomes yours. And I, along with that was this yearning to actually be in charge of my life, not to be out of control, out of power, controlled by somebody else. The problem with downing three beers is your blood merges with whatever was in that bottle or in that schooner or in that jug, right? Pint of ale. Who made that? I don't know. Well, it's, it's you now. You have to wait until that's out of your system before you really can be in charge of your life. And guess what? The things you do during that time, who pays the price? You do. So would you rather be responsible for things you're proud of? Things that you, decisions you made that were fully yours? Or would you rather be responsible for things you did while you were stoned or drunk out of your gourd. Your choice, because ultimately, you're the one who pays. So that was the, the big awareness was, yeah, I think I would rather pay for the things that I had when I had 100% of my decision-making powers available to me. I wasn't you know, confused. So that was a choice. And boy, what a turning place, what a turning point, what a crossroads that was. So now that's a one story of, of what it was like to have this teacher be face to face. In fact, physically I was. And the words that Shurfu was saying, of the words of Dharma he was explaining, came out of my mouth in English. And there was a moment I realized when I thought, I need to be better for what I'm doing here. It's kind of like, to change the metaphor, if you were, you had a camera, okay, so here's, let's say this is your camera, all right? 
So it's not, it's a phone. Let's say it's your camera, your phone camera. And before you use it to take a picture of, of your parents' anniversary, there, everybody's smiling, right? Before you take that picture, you lick your thumb and smear it over your lens. Then you take your picture. How's that going to look? Compared to, you know, not that I recommend this, but take a nice cloth and I don't know if Kleenexes are any good for these, but, you know, clean it off. Then take the picture. How does that look? I definitely had the feeling at one point that I was responsible for the English listeners, English language listeners, ability to pick up on what Scherfer was saying. And if the words I was saying came out of my confusion, I was cheating them. They weren't going to get closer to Scherfer through me as the translator. I needed to polish my lens. And by golly, next Friday night, when the beers went around and the other stuff, I thought, Tomorrow I'm going to be translating. Pass. I'll pass. Give me some orange juice. Give me a, some, you know, tea. Tea is get you high on caffeine. So, and then the next morning, next there I was sitting beside Shurfu the next afternoon after lunch. I didn't smell like I'd been out of my mind the night before. And I felt that the words that came out of me, through me, from him, I could stand behind and say that was my best. That was my best shot. My Chinese had limits. My wisdom had definitely had limits. But that was my best version at representing Shurfu's sutra lecture. And there was no going back, you know. I didn't want to come through the door of Gold Mountain anymore without trying my best at presenting a clean camera lens, using that metaphor, right? So that came because Shurfu knew my state and didn't reject me, didn't judge me, didn't criticize me, but clearly knew exactly where I was. And that was profound. That was a transformative moment for sure. So, let's go back at our text here, and it says, dig it up here, there we go. The, through the Tathagata's awe-inspiring spiritual power, everybody in southern Jambudvipas, plural, in the continents of the world every, in every direction, as well as those in the tri heaven, the summit of Mount Sumeru, Polar Mountain, witness the Buddha sitting in each of these places. The bodhisattvas there surrounding the Buddha got blessed by the Buddha's spiritual strength and with that inspiration began to speak Dharma. Every single one of them felt that the Buddha sat right in front of them. How about that? By golly, that's what happened. <laughs> Pretty cool. So, uh, there's going to be a welcome by the king of the Suyama heaven. He, what he does, he makes a throne. He prepares a seat for the Buddha to sit on. Because here's the Buddha coming up to his, his heaven. He's going to do it right because the Buddha from that heaven is going to speak the Dharma of the Ten Practices chapter, Shi Heng Pin, the Ten Practices chapter, and Shi Wu Jin Zhang, the Ten Inexhaustible Treasuries chapter. Those two are going to be explained here in the Suyama heaven. That's coming up. After this, the next heaven up, we get to hear about the Shi Hui Xiang Pin, the Ten Dedications chapter. Following that comes the 10 practice, the, the 10 grounds, 10 stages that we just heard. So that's where we are. That's coming up next. What do they say? Don't miss it if you can. You won't be late, but you will have to hurry. Hey, look, it's new, it's different, it's educational, it's entertaining. 
take one home to little Jimmy. Said my Uncle Freeman, who uh, listened to the Carney Barkers in southeastern Canada. All right. Yeah. By golly. Um, let's see. What do we got? We're, yeah. Okay. I wanted to, at this point, we are coming into the uh, season of Buddha's birthday. It's uh, the full moon in May, the lunar calendar. And Buddha's birthday is celebrated exactly on different days by different traditions. But we all agree that this is the time when uh, the Prince Siddhartha uh, came into, was born to Lady Maya and nine dragons emerged and bathed him. That's why we do the Buddha bathing as to celebrate. He took seven steps and said, Tian Shang, Tian Xia, Wei Wo Du Zun. Above, here in the heavens, and down below, here in people, among humans, I am the one most honored, or I will be the one most honored. Uh, so, Wei Wo Du Zun, he said. Now, um, the uh, Buddhist, let's see, I'm going to, I had the, uh, I think it's over here, let's see here. There is an event coming up um, in the Indonesian Buddhist, I want to get the name right, Indonesian. See here, is this it? Yes, uh, here it is. That's what I was looking for. Today, the tenth. There we go. There we go. Okay. Share my screen. There it is. Okay. April tenth to May eighth. The international. The let's see here. International Dharma Teaching, KCBI, which has a Bahasa name, um, is planning an online event. I'm going to lead off this afternoon at 5 p.m. here, Gold Coast time, uh, which is 3 p.m. in uh, Jakarta. Um, it's 3 p.m. in China as well. And I'll be the first of five teachers, Ajahn Jayasaro, uh, quite a distinguished monk in the Thai forest tradition, disciple of Ajahn Chah, will be speaking um, on May 1st. Uh, Dzermang Garwang Rinpoche will be following me. He's the 12th incarnation on April 17th. Uh, Lumpur uh, Santusago Mahatera will be speaking on 24th of April, and Ajahn Chagino, who is a, a friend, Dharma friend, will be, he's a marvelous photographer, among other things. Ajahn Chagino will be speaking on May 8th. That's the one, the last one, Buddha's birthday day. So our topic is, the spirit of the Buddha's teaching leads to a beautiful and happier life. Should people want to register, go to kcbi.or.id forward slash ID registration and you can, they'll send you a link to listen in. There will be translations into uh, Bahasa Indonesia, English, Thai, and Mandarin, depending on what you start with. So I'll start with English. So I get translated into Bahasa, Thai, and Mandarin. Okay, that's coming up. Just to say another lecture that I'm, I'm giving four lectures this weekend. So this is this afternoon at 5 p.m. here in Queensland, uh, 3 p.m. in Jakarta, 3 p.m. in Taipei and Shanghai. Uh, and it's really late for the U.S. It's very late. So here's the registration. 
Got to be quick, show it once. kcbi.or.id forward slash IDT, IDT registration, not ID, IDT registration, registration. And I am, I'd like you to know, Venerable Professor Bhikshu Dharma You all should be much more respectful. So, okay, there we go. Now, uh, what am I going to talk about? That's what I wanted to share in the last few minutes here. I'm going to talk about what, uh, what I, why I think the Buddha's teaching is going to catch on in the 21st century among folks who haven't heard it before, among not, not the faithful per se, but people who are educated in a 20th and 21st century context. That is to say, science is part of their way of looking at faith. They are thinking critically. People who have a critical thinking, empirical education, meaning science-based, evidence-based education. Why I think Buddhism is going to catch on to, to those folks. And the reasons are that Buddhism is the most science-friendly of major religions. Buddhism never had its uh, renaissance moment where we had to either choose between the church or or our senses. Europe, with Christianity, had that moment, and scientists were put in jail. Copernicus in uh, Poland, I actually sat in the university where Copernicus taught, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Um, so Copernicus' vision that the sun was the center, not not the earth, caused him to be censured and imprisoned. So, okay, Buddhism is very much, the Buddha, the, the prince's investigation of his own mind is very much like the way a scientist approaches the material world by asking questions, saying, what is this? Who, who's really in there, who's in charge? So that's one. Two, Buddhism is strongly oriented towards psychology. And much of the 20th century um, preceded, much of the in investigation, life of the mind, proceeded from the discovery of psychiatry and psychology, the idea that we perceive the world now through our understanding of the mind. Uh, people are asking what possesses a Russian dictator who has been re-elected for 20 years, what possesses him to attack a sovereign nation and kill people happily to satisfy his megalomaniac insatiable greed and his confusion. What makes Putin think he is free to do that? We understand him in psychological terms. Oh, well, it may be because he's a little man, he's short, he's got this little chip on his shoulder, or maybe he was just brainwashed while he was a KGB spy into thinking that this is, you know, that he is going to become the next Vladimir the second, you know. Uh, people, we think of ourselves and our family members in psychological terms. Oh well, he was this person was a mass murderer. He took his, uh, you know, AR-15, semi-automatic military assault weapon, and turned it on a classroom of children because he was deprived of the love he needed as a boy. You know, with us, we understand ourselves in terms of psychology these days. So the Buddha Dharma has been doing this kind of investigation into the mind for 2,500 years and left a paper trail, explained how we too can look deeply into the mind. So psychotherapy, psychiatry, and Buddhism are really good friends. This is, this is an important part. Furthermore, 
Buddha Dharma is a religion for people whose view is post-tribal. When we were still not aware of people who lived the next valley over, much less who lived on the other side of the world, we were still based on tribes. How do you say xiao xiao shu xiao shu zhong zhu zhong zhu xiao shu tribes right chun zhong chun zhong ren sort of and when we're tribal we suspect everybody everybody who's different is a threat uh, we have to protect ourselves against anybody who's different and we do it militarily until it's time to trade we trade with them but then we go back to suspecting them that they want to steal the stuff that I have and. If I don't take all of it, then they're going to get some of it, and there won't be enough for me. This kind of zero-sum tribal perspective is pre-modern, but we're at a different time now. Uh, ever since, ever since this happened, we're in a different time. This is. Earthrise. This was a photograph taken in 1968 by an Apollo 8 astronaut who made his fourth pass around the moon. This was Apollo 8 went to the moon, orbited the moon, and it came up around the moon on the fourth pass. And the astronaut, I've forgotten his name, he had a Hasselblad camera, stuck it out the window, and went. <coughs> Once we saw this, everything was different. It's different because we see the Earth is just that, and it has limits, and the water on it is what makes it different. Look at the moon in the foreground. Can we live there? No,、nope, not enough water. Our bodies need it. Look at the blue marble out there. That will sustain us. But that's it. There isn't a second planet. There's no planet B. There's only planet A. We gotta take care of it. I believe that's Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Huh? Interesting. So, here we go. That landmass there. So,、uh, is that Australia? Could be. Yeah. 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 There we are. Wave, everybody.、Here. Yeah. So, okay. This was Apollo 8. It's called Earthrise. This famous photograph that was taken. And after we see that, things are different. Things are different. We realize that we have to get along, and it can't be the case that men are the only voices that matter. Men have destroyed the planet. Women, not so much. Women don't mobilize and build tanks to go off and destroy others' bodies and buildings and homes. Not so much. It's time. To get beyond the tribal view and learn how to live peacefully in harmony for the well-being of all, and the Buddha Dharma shows us that vision. It has never, with a few notable exceptions, ever gone to war as a faith. People don't march to the Buddha's flag, kill the enemy for the Buddha. We don't do that. Now, there are exceptions, right? Sri Lanka, Burma, Japanese Harakiri samurai vision. You know Harakiri airplanes,、uh, kamikaze airplanes, kamikaze divine wind. So, with those exceptions, there's never been a Buddhist-inspired war. Okay. Monks of Mount Hiei in Japan tried to overthrow the shogun, and the shogun wiped them out. Kamakura, Buddhist history in Japan. Other than that, not. So this is a religion for、uh, a new people, a global people. And then finally, there's one more that I haven't even. I don't have time to talk about. Time's up, but I'm going to hit this one strongly, which is.、Um, The Buddhism that comes from Asia is full of gods. It's full of Tian Long Ba Bu, the Tian Long Ye Cha, Luo Cha, Zhou Pan Cha, 
uh, Jalo Lo, Jin No Lo, Moha Lo Che, Ren Fe Ren Dang. That's the Eightfold Pantheon. Gods, dragons, yakshas, Gandharvas, Garudas, Mahoragas, Kinaras, humans, non-humans, and the rest. Buddhism takes us into motes of dust and says, look, these are populated by living beings. How do they, it goes, the Buddha contemplated a single drop of water and saw 84,000 creatures inside that drop of water. If we do not stop eating creatures, we are, we are becoming, cannot, uh, if I don't recite, it goes, Fu guan yi bo shui, ba wan si qian chong, ruo bu chi zi zhou, ru ru shi zhong sheng rou. The Buddha saw in a single drop of water 84,000 creatures. If I don't recite this mantra, it's as if I were eating the flesh of living beings. It's as if I were a cannibal. That's a mantra that's in the Buddha's monastic tradition. The idea that the Buddha's wisdom sees microscopically as well as globally, universally. So he, that verse has been around for thousands of years, the Buddha predated microscopes. He saw the life in a single drop of water. So the theology reflects that vision. That's the point. Buddhist non-theos theology, we don't have a god, but it's theo theology. The Buddhist description of the cosmos says, yes, we are surrounded by countless numbers of living beings. We need to live in a way that reduces harm to living beings. We have to live for ahimsa, wuhai, no harm. That's the right way to live. Otherwise, the karma of killing will come for us, just the same as if we, you know, did it on purpose. So that is that idea of reanimating nature attracted me as a Protestant Methodist whose description of the universe took everything down to one word, logos. Jesus' word in the Gospels is all there is. Get rid of Jesus on the cross. Get rid of the saints in the stained glass windows. Get rid of any sense of hell beings, ghosts, or animals. They don't exist. Animals are just there to feed us. That's all. They don't have souls, right? That very sterile view of the world around us was what we inherited through the Renaissance. Rene Descartes, animals are automatons. They are there for our service. They're there to serve us. We kill them, eat them, doesn't matter. They don't, doesn't, doesn't hurt. They don't feel anything. So, you know, that was a, that's a impoverished view of the universe. Furthermore, it's an irresponsible view. Humans don't have to take responsibility for anything. Extract the oil, cut down the trees, pollute the water, doesn't matter. Right? Because we're not responsible. We're not connected. We're not related to any of it. Well, the Buddha Dharma pre presents an alternative to that view. It says, yes, we are connected. We are related. We are responsible. Humans are not in the center of the universe. We are one Dharma realm amid ten Dharma realms. We should use our wisdom and our compassion to take charge, to take care of all the other beings who we can affect and help and put at ease and give them the same kind of care and concern that I want to receive from others. Golden rule works really well, right? So that's number four, the fourth reason why I think Buddha Dharma is going to catch on in the 21st century because it's the most ecological aware religion. The things the Buddha described make sense to me as our best science describes the universe, right? And if we don't take care of it, it is our peril. We will no longer be able to live here if we continue to abuse the planet. We will find it unlivable. There won't be enough water, won't be enough food. The weather will continue to take our homes and Who's to blame? Okay, there you go. That's coming up. I'll be lecturing on that today at five o'clock.
if you're here in Australia, uh, three o'clock. If you're in Asia, uh, seven. Let's see, way late. Let's see. My 5 p.m. is, I'll, I have a lovely little app here. My 5 p.m. is California's midnight. <laughs> you want to stay up to midnight? Don't recommend it. I'm hoping they will post it later. I'll let you know if they do. All righty, there we go, by golly. Um, we need uh, to ask Jin Chuan, Jin Wei Shi, and the Berkeley Monastery to give us the rundown of what's happening in our, uh, in our programs, and also the dates of the, the um, 10,000 Buddhist repentance. Could you go to the website, Dharma Master? I will do that. We have all the events there. All righty. Including 10,000 Buddha's repentance. Yeah, we just put it there too. How about, wouldn't you like, anybody got a spare $6,000? No, six million, right? Six million, six million. Six thousand, maybe we can yeah, figure it out. Yeah, we can get a Yeah, we can get a Vihara. Good wouldn't idea. that be nice? Yeah, that'd, oh, be, yeah. A good, that'd be a good it idea. It would fit very well. Fit very well, exactly. But an alternative would be to learn how to make them yourself. Do it yourself. <laughs> From Redwoods. From Redwoods, why not? Yeah. Okay. That way there's no limit. We can spread them around. Berkeley. What's that? You bet. Okay. Here's 10,000 Buddhas. Here we are. Here's the website. Go ahead. So as the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery website, which is berkeleymonastery.org, you can find a lot of new events about what's going on in the upcoming weeks and uh, month. So first, 10,000 Buddhas Repentance, April 10th to May 7th, 2022. And you'll see a PDF there with the schedule. When I looked at it, the schedule for the weekends is in the morning and also in the afternoons, whereas the uh, schedules for the weekdays is slightly modified. So it's just early morning and afternoons. I think they're trying to accommodate people in the, the world who might want to or me working who um, might want to participate. So there's a Zoom link there and the ID and code is below. Okay. So if you want to join, please do. Good. The next is we're happy to share with everyone that we're just starting to reopen Berkeley Monastery. Um, we're starting the in-person meditation on Thursdays and Fridays. We're thinking of taking it a little bit at a time. And so we're, we're just being extra careful um, but if there are those who have been asking and wanting to come to the monastery, um, please register online. Um, and we can come on Thursdays and Fridays to start. And we're, re we're requesting people to still maintain three feet apart in our Buddha hall when you're meditating, masks with N95 or KN95s, and a vaccination. So you'll find that information on the, on the website. Yeah. Okay. And then we have an Amitabha session coming up as well. This Friday, from April 15th to the 17th, there'll definitely also be ground bell playing. So Jing Fo Shi will be leading everyone in ground bell. Pure Land Orchestra. Pure Land Orchestra, that's right. Um, Pure Land Stan Orchestra, Wu is that what you're calling yeah. it? <laughs> Jing Fo is at Pure Land Orchestra. Yeah. Oh, there we go, all right. Um, there's eight precepts will be transmitted on Saturday. So just know we'll be trying to precept on Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. for those who wish to take it and want to join the Amitabha session. Um, you also can fill out a memorial plaque for a memorial plaques below. So the Pai Wei, uh, a memorial Pai plaque Wei. is a Pai Wei. Yeah. So, so for those who wish to join, um, that's a really, uh, what we call it? In auspicious. Auspicious event. <laughs> yep. Indeed it is. Okay. Next, next event. Okay, I realized that the Buddha's birth and the ten thousand Buddha repentance has been changed in terms of its length. It goes all yeah. like, so. We are going to have to look at it, but at least right now, our Buddha's birthday was planned on May seventh, two thousand twenty-two, which is the day before the Buddha's birthday at CDDB, which is on May eighth. Um, so we will look Adjust, at that, yeah. but but we might. We either keep that date or we might move it to another time where it doesn't overlap the 10,000 Buddha's repentance. Just because I realized they, they changed it to, they lengthened it. Right. Yeah. They're, because they, they can't do, ordinarily it's three weeks, 21 days. 
Yeah. This time they can't do as many hours every day, so they have to lengthen the, the number of yeah. weeks. So we will, this might be actually change time. So uh, we will update the website as, as, um, as we figure it out. You can sign up online to have your name read at our ceremony. It was very popular in previous years. So uh, please join in. Okay. There's our Yu Fo Jie Shi Jia Moni Fo. Oh yeah, there's also if you keep going. If you keep going down, there's also the Suna Center retreat. Okay, we just had a three steps one bow event for Ukraine. We just finished that. Okay. It was a very wholesome event with a lot of uh, Polish friends calling in and sharing their experiences. Wow. Um, we, I think there's a recording online. In YouTube, on, on YouTube, YouTube, if you want find to, to find it. But if you go down, there's another one, which is the Suna Center Retreat, which is also in person, coming May 28th to June 5th. Uh, please sign up as soon as possible, because I think they were probably starting to hit the limit for um, participants due to COVID. And so there's going to be a waiting list very soon. So if you want to join, please sign up. That it, Yeah, that's not an online event. Yeah, that's, that's in person. In person. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. So that will be a change as the Berkeley Monastery reopens. Yeah, it'll be a change. All right. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, all the information. Now, um, it is time to dedicate merit now, transfer merit. And we're going to stick with our Medicine Buddha's mantra for now because we're just hearing today about a new blend, a new variant of the COVID strain which blends Delta and Omicron, which is pretty scary. So it may not be over and uh, it's likely not over. And the, uh, our Mahayana tradition gives us a mantra, which is just excellent to give us something to do. We don't have to feel that we're kind of helpless in the face of these pandemic uh, viruses. So to learn this mantra and to recite it gives you something to do that is rooted in tradition and has the, the virtue of Medicine Buddha's past vows in it. So we're doing the Sanskrit version do people, if people don't know, this is called the, in Chinese, Yao Shi Guan Ding Zhen Yan. It's the mantra that, of Medicine Buddha for anointing the crown of the head. It's the one that goes, Namo Bo Che Fa Di, Bi Sha Shi Ju Lu Bi Liu Li, that one. Find it in your yellow ceremony book among the 10 small mantras, if you prefer the Chinese.
close today by bowing three times to the Buddha right here from my chair. I invite you to do the same if you care to. Here we go. to the Venerable Master. All right, that's going to do it for us from today. See you all next week. Amitofo. Bye, everybody.